Good evening, Trinidad and Tobago, and good evening to all those who are tuned into this program from other jurisdictions abroad. Welcome to the National Consultation on Education 2020, hosted by the Ministry of Education. This consultation is designed to engage you, stakeholders in education, in transforming education in Trinidad and Tobago. The consultation focuses on six main areas where you would be asked to send in your contributions with regard to transforming those areas of operation. We are going to be looking at specifically areas such as blended learning, curricular reform, parental involvement in education, among others. Our engagement with you starts today through this first virtual town hall meeting, and it will be the first of six sessions which will be carded every Tuesday and Thursday for the following, uh, for the three week period. We look forward to engaging with you as we seek to build a better Trinidad and Tobago. Ladies and gentlemen, with that brief introduction, I am Claire Telemark, your moderator for today. And I have in studio with me the Minister of Education, the dynamic, the hardworking Minister of Education, whose task it is to transform the education system. And she is going to share with us her thoughts and her ministerial perspective on that coming transformation. Minister Nian Gatsby Dolly, welcome. Thank you so much. Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Keith Rowley, panelists for the evening, or moderator, Ms. Claire Telemark, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago at home and abroad. Good evening. The future of our country lies in the school bags of the children. I open with this quote as I find it pertinent to keep in our consciousness as we begin to engage with our stakeholders on this most important issue of education. The Ministry of Education has received unwavering support from you the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, as we continue to traverse the challenges presented by COVID-19. I thank you for all your commitment and for ensuring the success of the education sector. However, tonight, we begin a new task. We begin our national consultation under the theme, Transforming Education, It Takes a Village. What is the future of education in Trinidad and Tobago? What will inform the success of the leaders of tomorrow? Tonight and for the next month, we all get a chance to create a plan for what comes next. Through a series of town hall meetings, surveys, stakeholder engagement sessions, and portals through which citizens can submit written feedback, the National Consultation 2020 will explore seven critical areas the conduct of the secondary entrance assessment and transition to secondary school, the Concordat, curricular reform, blended learning, the role of parents and guardians in education, the role of the Teaching Service Commission, teacher training and development. It is important that we understand the impact that each of these areas has on the transformation of education in Trinidad and Tobago. We have made adjustments as necessary thus far, and teachers, parents, students have all worked with the ministry to keep the business of education going as efficiently as possible. As we strive to deliver quality, equitable, and accessible education to okay. all citizens, this consultation will allow our village to raise our children. In his address during a media conference on Saturday, our Prime Minister, Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley, reminded citizens of the measures this government has put in place to ensure that our country is safe and that citizens are able to maintain a semblance of normalcy. He highlighted how we will be going forward as we gradually allow our citizenry to have more freedom. This consultation forms part of that undertaking. The outcomes of this consultation will inform policy that will subsequently affect how the reopening of schools will look, how teachers will teach, how engagement will be facilitated on the national level, 
and most importantly, how all of this will result in the education of our most important resource, our children. Stakeholders, our goal is to have your input. We want to hear from you, and I encourage you all to call, text, WhatsApp, Write in and let us know your perspective on the areas of concern to you. It is a fact that Trinidad and Tobago, over the years since independence, has invested heavily in the education of our citizens. This means that our citizens have the ability to give the type of feedback that can inform and create an education sector that will be what is needed for national development and a successful future for Trinidad and Tobago. So what we do during the next few months has the power to make or break our country. Let us all pull the oars together with this in mind. As we begin, let us not for a second believe that any contribution is irrelevant. Our seven areas of consultation span the educational landscape of early childhood care and education, primary, secondary, tertiary, special education, and skills training. This consultation is for all of us. I thank you for joining us this evening and look forward with great anticipation to the fruitful, respectful, intellectual discourse that will redound to the benefit of us all. May God bless these proceedings as we engage in these discussions to provide access, equity, and quality education for all, noting always that transforming education takes a village. I thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Nian Gadsby Dolly, for those very critical reminders that the children are our most important resource mm -hmm. and that this opportunity is one that should not be missed by any stakeholder in Trinidad and Tobago. We all have an opportunity to be part of the transformation of education in Trinidad and Tobago. And therefore, we all have a part to play in national development. So to the public, please take every opportunity as the minister has exhorted you to ensure that your contributions come via the variety of means that are available to you. Uh, again, thank you, minister. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we take a short break and we'll be right back with you. What happens at Student Support Services? What is the purpose of Student Support Services? Well, a teacher can refer them, the guidance officer can refer them, and from there we have a multidisciplinary team that works towards ensuring that this child receives the best type of support. How are teachers here? The students themselves, this is their world. Social media, the platform, the laptop, all of those things, and Zoom, and all of these things, that's their world. National shutdowns due to COVID-19 have led to families being indoors for longer periods than normal, and heightened stress levels may lead you to lash out at your child. But here are a few things to remember as you interact with your child. One, take a few breaths before you respond to any misbehavior. This would help you to respond in a calm and collected manner. Two, try to find out what your child's behavior could be saying and try to redirect that behavior into a positive activity. Three, use consequences that you can realistically carry out. This helps to teach your children responsibility for their actions, and it's better than shouting and hitting. Finally, be proactive. You can help nip behaviors in the bud by continuing to remind your children beforehand of the type of behavior that you expect from them and praising them when they behave well. Let us continue to build positive relations with our children in spite of COVID-19. This is the start of a journey, bringing you the history of the African people from the beginning of time to the modern era. A TV series based on a unique project put together by UNESCO, known as the General History of Africa. Africa's history written and told by Africans.
Shub Diwali guys, I'm Raymond Ram Narayan from Your Delina Dan. Be viewing TTT Digiplay, TTT Live Online and the Digital Facebook for an amazing Diwali experience featuring Raymond and of course Your Delina Dan and the G3 family. It's gonna be fantastic. Happy Diwali. Mwah! Love you guys. <laughs> मुझे जो सही लगता है मैं करता हूं बजाय भगवान के खिलाफ हो समाज के खिलाफ हो पुलिस कानून या फिर पूरे सिस्टम के खिलाफ क्यों ना Welcome back, viewers. Tonight we make history because tonight we are having the first ever virtual town hall meeting ever held in Trinidad and Tobago. The circumstances dictate it. We are also very pleased to have with us a very special guest who will be sharing with us perspectives on education and the development of Trinidad and Tobago. He is none other than Dr. The Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley, Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and he will be sharing with us from his perspective as leader of national development, the tremendous input that education must play in this enterprise. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Prime Minister, Dr. The Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley to address you. Thank you very much and a very good evening to all participants. So I hope that a number of our citizens are taking the opportunity to get involved in this very um, interesting and pertinent discussion at the dinner table level, the household level. And um, I just want to say how pleased I am to be able to participate and to give you education from my perspective. And I, I trust that um, you will uh, go back a little bit with me before we go forward. Anybody who um, is prepared to discuss or to appreciate education in Trinidad and Tobago must appreciate the role that education has played in the sociology of the people and the development of its economy. Ever since we became independent and started being in control of our national allocation, one of the things that stand out is that the parents of the country, those who are governing the country, on behalf of the young people who need to be educated, and the not so young, I should say, we always had education as the number one national priority with respect to the allocation of resources. And this had been so for decades, except for one or two years in the recent times when the urgencies of national security caused us to have to spend a bit more on national security infrastructure in response to a crime wave which we have been experiencing for quite some time. But if we take that aberration out and look at national budgeting in Trinidad and Tobago, you will see that every single year the national budget consumed 
um, education consumed the single largest slice of that national pie. And that was for good reason, that we were investing in our future as a people. And that is where education is located and should be located in any discussion in Trinidad and Tobago. At the household level, it is quite likely that you will see the same thing, where before free secondary education, you would have seen a significant investment of the limited household resources being put towards educating sometimes only one child out of maybe eight or 10. And that, in some instances, produced um, some significant and spectacular outcome for that individual, but many others were left behind. In my own case, as a person growing up in a village here in Tobago, I am the first member of my family who went to high school because education at the high school level was beyond the reach of a family like mine. And my family was pretty much an average Tobago family, not being able to fund secondary education, even if the place was available in the one or two secondary schools that were available in Tobago at the time. And if you go back a little further, there's another peculiarity which we will find, which was peculiar then, but still is a force within our current education offering and our education uh, infrastructure. And that is the role of the state versus the role of the clergy. I went to Mason Hall Government School in Tobago, and I overheard conversations from my grandparents who raised me about the very uh, fervent um, discussions that took place when the idea came up about the government building a primary school. Because up until then, all the primary schools were operated and owned by different denominational bodies. We had um, in Tobago, we had the Catholic, we had the Anglicans, we had the Moravians, the Methodists. And children literally got their primary education through this ecclesiastical framework. But of course, there were shortcomings as the cost of education began to uh, bear down on those owners of those infrastructure and the bodies of the, 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 the church population. The churches were falling behind in being able to provide adequate standard of education and numbers of teachers and so on and paying the teachers. And the government of the day looked into this and decided, look, the time has come for the government to either assist or to get involved in somehow. And that caused a huge uh, conversation as to whether, in fact, the state should get involved in providing primary education. And it came to the point where the government had to agree that when the school was built, it being a government school and the teachers being government teachers, that they would allow the denominational bodies to come into this government school every morning and conduct religious knowledge classes with the various groupings of students, depending on their denominational uh, nomenclature. What I'm trying to touch on here is the combination of cost of education, the role of religion in education, allocation of national uh, responsibility, personal and home is responsibility in education dating back to the pre-independence time. And those elements of any discussion on education are still major pillars of the education system and offering and effort in Trinidad and Tobago today. Out of the the role of the, 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 the national bodies, we have the Concordat still in place, the Concordat very much in place. We have the church schools in place. We have the whole question of um, teacher appointment and allocations that is still in place. We have the affordability along the way. What used to be a $10 cost to a household for education in the 40s and the 50s is now a $10,000 cost. And of course, what used to be um, satisfactory, which is a, a sound primary education, now to feel that way as though you're properly and fully educated, we talk about a tertiary um, education offering. 
And of course, these are the complications that will form the threads of the fabric of any discussion on education in Trinidad and Tobago. But the one thing that we cannot say is that we have not had some significant success with what we have done in the last 40 or 50 years in Trinidad and Tobago. However, having said that, it does not mean that there are not serious shortcomings which need to be addressed. And in attempting to address any of those shortcomings, long ones or short ones, you will find that the points I just tried to touch on there will be in front of us to be discussed in the context of our current ability to finance, satisfaction with the product. We can discuss the curriculum and its role and whether in fact we are producing a citizen that the country can be satisfied with at the end of the education experience. We can also be concerned about the responsibility placed on teachers and the breadth of discussion. Only this week, I think it was this weekend, I was reading a, a column written by Dr. Hollis Liverpool, who incidentally had been exposed to Tobago primary, primary education. And he touched on what formed the components of the curriculum. And it made me wonder whether that curriculum at that time, when he went to primary school, whether that curriculum, when compared with what exists now, the extent of what was available and how it was um, imparted to students, whether in fact we were getting better value for money then as compared to now. These are questions that we have to ask and answer honestly. What we have to be concerned about is whether the population is prepared to make the adjustments that uh, an honest and open discussion would throw up for us. Because certain recommendations will arise, and some of those recommendations will be far reaching with respect to the implications for who does what if we are to make the significant changes that have to be made in education now to make that next leap. Because if we go across our history from pre-colonial times to immediate post-colonial to early independence to now, we will see that there are a number of thresholds in education. And from time to time, we sought to address them. And we have had a varied levels of success. This discussion that the Honourable Minister is uh, driving now and encouraging the population to get involved in is really a discussion about our future as a people and our children and our grandchildren future as to whether in fact what we are doing now is the best that we can do and whether we are preparing them for a changing world on the outside. There was a time before where there was some element of stagnation in what we were doing in education where um, if you had a primary education for many decades that could have served you. Today, with the fast pace of technology and the interrelationships of the world, Education has to be seen as a vehicle that has to take us into areas where we may need assistance from those who we meet. And we may, be, we may be required to have skills that we had not been exposed to before. So these are far reaching considerations which I think parents, teachers, all um, involved in this business of preparing and in fact, the whole concept of education being a continuous process. And of course, the ability to participate in the national economy and the social structure of the country by being properly educated. Some of us may have been coming to a conclusion that we were getting very good at and getting better at um, certificating as against educating. And if that is so, we need to find that balance between the requisite need for having certificates and what certificates mean as against being educated, even without a certificate. So I look forward to this discussion. I don't know what I will hear. I don't know what the outcome would be, but I, I, I am anticipating that those of us who have been exposed to the education system those of us who are parents or who expect to be parents, 
those who have been in the system who have provided education, that with all of us talking about this subject of education in a dispassionate way, we will be able to identify our own product, identify ourselves, our culture, and our vision, and at the end, come up with recommendations for improvement within the context of the 21st century where we are being asked to prepare our next generation. So I eagerly await the outcome, and I may be able to join you later on and to participate in it as we go on, but the, the finished product should leave us in a position to make whatever adjustments are required to be made through public policy. Because public policy in education is about as fundamental a government offering as any other in Trinidad and Tobago. And if it comes out of a wide discussion and honest assessments, especially in a diverse society like ours, then our time would have been well spent and our children and grandchildren would be beneficiaries of an exercise uh, whose time would have come. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Prime Minister Rowley, for your perspectives. Uh, Prime Minister Rowley reminded us that education is an investment in our future, the future of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And I think one of the more significant things that he reminded us of is the fact that if we are to transform our education system, it will require significant changes to be made. And the question that we must all answer is whether we as stakeholders are prepared to make those adjustments in terms of what we currently enjoy. There may be those stakeholders who may be required to do more or to give up some of what they currently enjoy. And can we have open and honest discussion in a non-judgmental environment so that we can truly address whatever shortcomings we may bring up in our particular discussions? At the same time, I thank him for the reminder that we have much to celebrate in our education system, and we must always recognize that while we work to uh, shortening those gaps that we can identify. So thank you very much, Prime Minister Rowley, and of course, we look forward to you joining some of those other sessions. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move right into a significant part of our program, we are going to be having a conversation with two gentlemen seated in the studio with me. We have to my immediate left, uh, the former Chief Education Officer of the Ministry of Education, Mr. Harilal Sicharan. He is the immediate past retired um, Chief Education Officer. Before that, before he ascended to the position of Chief Education Officer, he would have been Assistant Director of Educational Research and then Director of Educational Research, as a result of which he led the Ministry of Education in two very significant assessments. These are international assessments, the world-renowned PISA assessment and, of course, PERS. As well, he has provided oversight of the administration of our SEA, or Secondary Entrance Assessment um, um, programs for a number of years and therefore has quite a lot of experience and knowledge of the SEA. Uh, he has um, significant training in monitoring and evaluation, quality management, test design and development, uh, leadership and management, project management, among others. Because of all that experience and, of course, his qualification, he was recently appointed to the team that is looking at review of the CSEC and CAPE results of 2020. To his left, we have none other than Professor Jerome Delisle. And Dr. Delisle is a lecturer at the School of Education, the University of the West Indies where he focuses a lot on preparing masters of education students in leadership and other areas. He earned his PhD at a very young age, as far back as 1994, and he has multidisciplinary training in areas as varied as sociology, psychology, etc. He has spent a significant part of his tenure at the university researching this 
for want of a better term, contentious issue of SEA and has published papers both locally within the Caribbean and internationally investigating the effects of the SEA on students, the young students, the 11 plus students. He has spent a lot of time investigating um, how gender and geography play out in terms of the outcomes of the SEA. So as you would have recognized tonight, our topic for discussion is the SEA or the Secondary Entrance Assessment Examination, as we call it, and of course the transition to secondary schools. Mrs. Sonia Mahes, who is the president of the Association of Assisted Secondary Schools, was invited to be a guest on the program. Unfortunately, she's unable to be with us because of a prior commitment. So tonight, we are very, very pleased to have, as I said, Mr. Sicharan and Professor Delisle to share with us their perspectives. Each of these stakeholder contributors will have three minutes to share their perspectives on the topic, the SEA and the transition to secondary school, keeping in mind that it is an examination that all students who come out of the primary school must sit in order to transition to the secondary school. The placement is determined on, based on a number of criteria in terms of parental choice, in terms of student performance on the SEA, there is an order of merit list, in terms of gender, because we have schools that are single sex, we have schools that are co-educational, in terms of residence, when students are unable to be placed in their first four choices, and of course, multiple births uh, would be another category where, um, that people look at when we are looking to place students. Um, and of course, that very critical issue of the 20% for denominational boards. Uh, just a reminder that students don't only transition to the traditional secondary schools, some of them may be placed in uh, civil life centers, for example. And these would be students who would be over the age of 13 and who may have written the SEA for a second time, and their scores would be less than 30%. If you are less than 13 years old um, and you would have written the SEA just for the first time, you have an opportunity to repeat the exam or resit the exam. So with that, just that brief introduction, I would like to go right into the contribution from Mr. Harry Lal Sicharan, former Chief Education Officer of the Ministry of Education. Mr. Sicharan. Thank you, Claire. Good evening to all our viewers and, and listeners. I think we need to keep in mind what the minister identified as the three fundamental pillars, equity, quality, and access to education. The Prime Minister earlier hinted uh, about the skill set that, that we would like our students leaving primary and secondary schools to have. If we were to look at the primary school system, one would agree that the SEA is the one thing that has the most significant impact. I think as we go through the discussions this evening, we need to keep in mind, one, what is the purpose of SEA, which is simply placement exam. But we also need to keep in mind the role of SEA and the impact and the influence it has on the primary school education system and whether, in fact, it is supporting or actually working counter to those skills and competencies that our students come out of primary schools with. Every year, we have a number of students writing the exam, all competing for essentially approximately 4,500 school places in certain schools. You therefore have, on average, every year, approximately 14,000. Let me be a little bit more students who don't get their first choice and either are dissatisfi dissatisfied or maybe, so to some degree, unhappy. And that translates into requests for reviews, queries, requests for transfers. A lot of that over the years I've realized is linked to a lack of understanding of the criteria that is required. 
in the placement process, in other words, the process and the methodology used, in addition to that, the lack of understanding of some of the terms and concepts, for example, on the performance report confusion between percentile and percentage, so that there is a lot of uncertainty and lack of understanding in the process. And as we go through the discussions this evening, I hope we get a chance to look at some of these, whether in fact there, it's a lack of understanding, in fact, whether the SEA is serving our needs in terms of the outcomes, which is the bigger issue at the primary school level. Thank you. Thank you very much for closing with that question. Is the SEA serving our needs in terms of the outcomes that it has or the effects that it would have, particularly on our primary school system. So thank you again, uh, Mr. Sicharan, and we go right over to Professor Jerome Delisle, and I would like to ask those viewing to make a note of your thoughts, your comments that you would um, be bringing to bear into the discussion um, later on. So, Professor Delisle. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, one of the things I've learned as far as policy is concerned, because I study policy as far as high stakes exams um, are concerned, is that really there's no perfect policy. Each society must look at the benefits and compare it with the disadvantages or the consequences. What we are seeing recently are societies which also have the ability to lessen or reduce those consequences. So as we go forward, I think it's a, a very important thing to look at the SEA. Um, it's been with us for a long time. It was seen as a way to achieve fairness, if you look at the writings of uh, our first Prime Minister. You have to ask, in 2020, is the SEA still doing that? But more than that, we have to look at the alternatives. What are, how fair are the alternatives? Um, are the alternatives, do they provide a fair opportunities? I think that's something very, very important to, to look at. And as you know, one of the things that I have been trying to do is to benchmark different societies because there are still uh, early high stakes exams in the Netherlands, used to be in Hong Kong. Singapore has decided to retain their primary school e exit exams. What are the reasons? What are the arguments for or against removing the exam? And you see differences. Now, both Hong Kong and Singapore are high-performing countries. Hong Kong has decided years ago to, to remove their aptitude tests. But what they've had to do because of the tendency to focus upon uh, choosing schools is they've had to continue to encourage the society to focus on other types of assessment, formative assessment. And Singapore recently decided that they were going to retain the examination, but they have a series of measures in order to reduce uh, uh, the effects. So Trinidad and Tobago, as it grows and matures and becomes more reflective, we have the opportunity to really look at these societies as we create our own path. Thank you very much, Professor Delisle, for raising some very significant questions. Again, questions that I would ask the general public to consider, and I would like to repeat some of them. And he said, um, this is not a question, but a comment that there is no perfect policy, that there are always benefits and consequences. The question would be, are we prepared to live with the consequences of some of those policies and how much of the um, consequences are fair and just. Um, can we design a better system 
one that is fairer. I am using my own words. Can we have, again, a more just system? And in considering your responses, the, what are the arguments for removing or retaining the exam? So thank you very much, um, Professor Delisle. I would just like to share with viewers how you can engage with us as we conduct this town hall meeting. You have the opportunity to call in, and the number, let me just, um, OK. You can call in through TTT's phone lines while we are engaged in the process. Uh, and the number is 622-4141 extension 4, 622 4141, extension 4. You can also uh, send messages through WhatsApp, and the number for that is 7760440. The WhatsApp number, 7760440. You can send email contributions, and this is the email address. It is education consultation. 2020 at moe.gov.tt. I repeat, education consultation 2020 at moe.gov.tt. So there are several ways in which you can engage with the conversation as we move forward. So continue to think things through based on the conversations that you would have, or the contributions you would have heard from our esteemed panelists, and we will engage with you very, very shortly. Thank you. We now go to a break. And when we return, stakeholder contributions. I won the Miss Universe title in 1977, becoming the first Trinidadian to win the title and also the first person of color in the history of the competition. I would remember when I entered the Miss Universe pageant, it would have been TTT that filmed it locally, being there to service and provide entertainment and content for the public. Hi, I'm Janelle Penny Commission, and I believe our story starts right here on TTT. <laughs> पुलिस कानून या फिर पूरे सिस्टम के खिलाफ क्यों ना शुभ दिवाली गाइस आई एम रेमन राम नारायण फ्रॉम योर दिल्ली नजान be viewing TTT DigiPlay, TTT Live Online, and Digital Facebook for an amazing Diwali experience featuring Raymond and, of course, your Delina Dan and the G3 family. It's going to be fantastic. Happy Diwali. Mwah! Love you guys. <laughs> This is the start of a journey, bringing you the history of the African people from the beginning of time to the modern era. A TV series based on a unique project put together by UNESCO, known as the General History of Africa. Africa's history written and told by Africans. What happens at Student Support Services? What is the purpose of Student Support Services? Well, a teacher can refer them, the guidance officer can refer them. And from there, we have a multidisciplinary team that works towards ensuring that this child receives the best type of support. How are teachers there? The students themselves, this is their work. Social media, the platform, the laptop, all of those things, and Zoom, and all of these things, that's their work. Welcome back, viewers. 
We are ready to begin the part of our program where we hear from critical stakeholders in the education system. But before we do that, I'm going to share with you a couple of the comments that we've received via live social um, media. Um, one person has suggested, let's have a moratorium on SEA. Can we talk about phasing it out in the next five years? And the other the suggestion is, SEA should be comprised of the children's cumulative record from each academic year, roughly three marks recorded in a database, one per term, so starting from standard one or two and ending with the first term mark in standard five. So those are some of the comments that we've received thus far and we'll be sharing with the wider um, uh, stakeholder grouping as we proceed. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us, coming in via um, Zoom, we have the president of the National Primary Schools Association to share for two minutes um, his perspective and, of course, the perspectives of his members. So without um, much um, ado, I hand you over to Mr. Lance Motley. Members, so without uh, much ado, Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. the Honorable Keith Rowley, Minister of Education, Dr. the Honorable Nian Gadsby Dolly, former Chief Education Officer, Mr. Harrell L. Sicheran, Professor Jerome Delisle, and other members of this esteemed panel. Good evening, and good evening to all of the viewers on TGT. The National Primary School Principals Association is indeed honored to be part of the esteemed group of stakeholders in education called upon to add its voice to this important discourse. It takes a village. Tonight's engagement and indeed the month long town hall meeting geared towards uh, enlisting the views of as many stakeholders as possible rings true and acknowledges the old adage that it does in fact take a village. The small, or this small but critical village that is Napsqua, I have been honored to lead, takes this engagement very seriously and look forward to a fruitful conversation on all those important subjects highlighted for discussion. We are hoping that at the end of this process, we would find a real working solutions to the issues identified. Like the Prime Minister, we too at NAPSPA don't know what the outcome will be, but we do hope that it will be one that realizes the return of our collective investment. Due to the precipitous onset of the coronavirus disease, teachers, and students across the nation were thrust into a new environment. And the impact of this new experience will be felt both in the short and in the long term. This academic year saw a test pollution, as it were, with the switch to online instruction and student learning significantly impacted by stress, anxiety, illness, being forced to learn in a vastly different method than previously experienced and the increased potential to fall behind due to lack of access to materials. According to Ebeld and Frisbee 1991, evaluation in education asks questions such as, how good is the performance? Have they learned enough? And is their work good enough? This speaks to summative evaluation, which is focused on what has been learned. However, all educators use the formative form which evaluates evaluates what students are learning. The SEA has traditionally been academically focused and does not serve to offer a report to the secondary level that speaks to the multiple intelligence of students. Even before COVID-19 impact, educators, stakeholders, agents, parents, students have grappled with the effectiveness of the secondary entrance exam as the driver for secondary placement in Trinidad and Tobago. A recent poll conducted by NAPSPA indicated that while many view SEA as a viable placement exam, they equally believe 
that it is not effectively performing that function to the benefit of the student. In fact, the survey revealed a definitive desire to see the exam evolve into something that is formative, developmental, tracking the real learning and ability of our nation's students. The COVID-19 experience has opened the glaring inadequacy of relying on one day and one of summative, one summative evaluation when the system has been placed into a non-contact online mode. Where the students peaking to achieve by exam drill had been interrupted, what happened? There was suddenly the reality that nowhere in the sector, primary, secondary, even tertiary, in some instances, were left scrambling for ideas to offer a developmental record of the student performance if needed. The response, not available at the primary level. That reality is the heart of the matter moving forward. Is Trinidad and Tobago prepared to maintain a status quo that has been a source of concern for years, more so this nation along with the world adapts to the reality of possible closure, loss of time and other challenges in the sector. As such, NAFSA stands ready to engage in active discussions with stakeholders to move to the review of the SEA and consider perspectives and models that have shown success in jurisdictions around the world. Adaptation requires us not only to look at other ideas, but to display the ingenuity of our nation and develop a system that fosters the best from our students and for our nation. I thank you. Very much, uh, Mr. Motley, for your contribution. And you speak on behalf of all primary school principals. And just to share or remind um, our viewers that you spoke to a more having a more developmental approach, and the fact that all primary principals are prepared to be part of the discussion going ahead. And a question again: Are we prepared to maintain the status quo? And are we prepared to come up with real working solutions to advance the cause of education? We move right into our next presenter. But just to let viewers know that during this segment, we may have calls coming in. We are prepared to entertain two calls. And I can read two um, WhatsApp messages. Um, so callers, you have the opportunity to call in after the contributions of our stakeholders. We will entertain, as I said, two calls, keeping in mind that as you connect, um, ensure that you mute your microphone, sorry, unmute your microphone as you are engaging with us. And of course, when your call is done, after one and a half minutes, you should ensure that you put it back on mute so that we do not have that interference. I would now like to have share with us the perspectives of the secondary school principals. And we have waiting to share his perspectives and those of the principals, the president of the Association of Principals of Public Secondary Schools, Mr. Ronald Mutu. Welcome, sir. Good night. Good night, and thank you very much. It is indeed my pleasure. It is indeed my pleasure to be here representing the Association of Principals of Public Secondary School on such an august uh, platform with so many dignitaries. Uh, all protocols observed, of course. Let me start by saying, according to the great man, Nelson Mandela, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. The importance of the educative processes then cannot be under stress. Indeed, the significance of education to nation building is, a, is one of the most powerful means by which this nation of Trinidad and Tobago can progress. I want to jump right into determining what is necessary for us to succeed in our educational objectives. And I want to do so simply by comparing a little bit, contrasting, if you will, the difference between the educative processes of yesteryear with today's. And, and the crux of the, the matter really lies with the educational, with the educational culture 
with the culture of education and the processes that are built in Jared. Firstly, I want to say that there is an emphasis today on critical thinking, problem solving, and other higher level skills. And these, of course, have been introduced and are being introduced into our SCA exams, etc. And the emphasis on this critical thinking, innovativeness, problem solving are to be underscored. Secondly, there is to be an emphasis as we are trying to do on inclusive education. There is then the need for, and I stress need, to diagnose educational learning di uh, disabilities. There is a, a huge gap in this, in this scenario in our educational processes which need to be fixed. Thirdly, emphasis on integration and use of the educational technologies in our daily practicing, which will promote uh, learning, uh, 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 pro use as a vehicle for creating learning rather than simply projecting rote learning. And finally, I want to say there is a consideration that we must, of course, embrace for SCA, as we know it, alternatives, alternatives to commonly we'd say the common entrance. And there is uh, uh, a need to say that the role of continuous assessment in the primary school system needs to be revisited. And I want to say it is an important part of the way forward, whether it is as part of the SCA or as part of the alternative to an SCA program. Thank so you very much. These are, are what I am hoping mm -hmm. that we will also uh, you know, yes, become engaged in, in this consultation. I thank, thank you, you very much, Mr. Mutu, and thank you for your views, particularly on inclusive education and the need to ensure that we take advantage of higher order thinking skills such as critical um, higher order skills such as critical thinking and problem solving. Right now, we have a call from San Fernando. San Fernando, you are live. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening to the panel there. This is a, uh, 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 my contribution is based on, and it's for anyone on the panel, based on the secondary assessment. What I am looking at is that whether going forward we are, will be looking at is there a need to still have SEA with this competitive nature where children are competing for an assessment and whether or not we have enough schools based on the population, the different areas that we live in whether there are enough schools in each area, primary and secondary, that children, that you don't have to be assessed, that, should, that is there a reason why we should still have choices in where you go to school? Why not go to school in the area that you live? If it is that we are going forward and we are looking at eliminating that all schools should be prestige schools, Children, we are looking at where it's a competitive nature. We are speaking about why are we still um, giving the results um, in the media? Why are children at an early age being forced to compete for a placement in a secondary school that you do not live in that area? You are going to school, for example, you live in the San Fernando, and you, are, you have to go to school in Shogunas or Penal, can we change this format going forward? Um, and, and, and why should the state continue to fund privilege? Thank you very much, sir. I think the substance of your comment slash question has been received. Uh, do we still retain a system that is largely competitive and that all schools should be prestige schools? I would like to also share a comment uh, coming in live, we have uh, the education system needs to look at the whole system, 
not just primary. A broad spectrum is needed, from primary to secondary to tertiary to the current demands of the labor market. And the recommendation is a reduction in the number of secondary school choices from four to two, with one being in relation to where the child lives. So again, a reduction in the number of choices that you would have to make on the um, placement form from four to two, with one being in relation to where the child lives. Mm -hmm. We have a call from San Juan. San Juan, you are live. Hello. Yes, Hello? you are live. We are hearing you. Yes. Yeah, you're hearing me? Yes, we are. Yeah, um, good night yeah, to everyone. I just want to um, make some general contribution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. the, what, the outcomes of the symposium should impact policy, and I haven't really seen anything spoken about the Education Act. The Education Act of 1962, shortly after yeah, independence. That legal framework would need to really be revisited. But generally speaking, let's say you know, you have primary, secondary, tertiary. When you look at the history of education, the, the movement from primary to secondary was basically selective. So you had, you know, the government exhibition because you have two primary schools, you had no tertiary institutions. But then over time, that would have changed. Now, the, 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 in preparing the goals for education, for example, you have varying industries. You know, you have, you have the, 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 the um, different sectors. But when we look at some of the sporting sector, the cultural sector, we need to have a, a new type of education and a new type of curriculum. So that, 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 exam, that, that assessment from primary to secondary based on the age, age grouping should be more diagnostic. For example, we need to have, let's say if you look at, the, if you look at sports and culture, where we have the strength, the curriculum should really be, be, be based on the strengths of the Caribbean people. So we need to have like full-time sporting academies, let's say cricket, where an entire curriculum could be devised and developed around cricket. Similarly, in culture, you know, there is the, um, there's the philosophy by Lloyd Best, you know, you don't put pan in school, you put, you put education in pan. You have a good, good, good um, um, space now whereby, you know, like the, the new pancake that you get in forest field, yes. Yeah. Um, that could be converted into an educational environment. But of course, it will impact the curriculum. So the whole concept of education would need to be revisited rather than focusing on the effort. I mean, mm -hmm. the taking into consideration is strengthening people, maybe the support. Thank you very much, Paula. I, I believe we have grasped the substance of your um, contribution with regard to playing to the strengths of the culture of Trinidad and Tobago, academies in sport and culture, and of course the very critical um, contribution about um, looking at our legal and legisla le legislative framework. We have a call from Dego Martin. Dego Martin, you are live. Hello, good night. One and a half minutes. Diego Martin. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good evening. I would like to address the elephant in the room about the, the 1960 Concordat. Would you agree with me that they are... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello? Mm -hmm. Yes, we are hearing you. Okay, that that churn on schools that they're not supposed to be because of our um, agreement that boards should choose their children who belong to that seat before other children, 20%, which is wrong because it have children out here who have the, the potential to be in that school and shine, and they cannot get into the school because of the of agreement that was signed quite in 1960. Secondly, I would like to adjust the, the, the overcrowding of Port of Spain and schools, whereas other schools might have 25 children in one class. In Port of Spain, there are 35. Sometimes 40 children come up in our class. So how do you expect that to be a, um, a learning environment for our children in Port of Spain? Thank you very much. Like to speak about. Yes, yes thank you very much, Digo Martin, for your contribution with regard to the Concorda. Just to let you know that that topic will be up for discussion on uh, Thursday of this week. So whatever recommendations you may have with regard to 
how we can look at the position of the concordat in the education system, we can entertain then. Um, I would now like to ask um, Mr. Sicheran or Professor Delisle if they have any responses to any of the contributions from our stakeholders thus far. I can, I can just yes. briefly touch on a number of <coughs> areas. First one with policy. Um, Ms. Dr. Delisle spoke, Professor Delisle spoke about policy and there's no perfect policy. But I know that the ministry has been looking at the, the, the um, Education Act and therefore that will be, I guess, one of the areas that will have to move forward as we proceed with reforming the education system. Some of the contribution really spoke to the outcomes of primary school system. One of the callers spoke about the linkage between, I guess, early childhood and tertiary. And I think the conversation has to make those um, connections. So I think that that is useful. But in the primary school system in relation to SE and the, the areas mm -hmm. that are assessed, I think that results in the narrowing of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I think the president of NASPA spoke mm -hmm. about the focus on drill and road. And therefore, if we are to move towards those 21st century skills, then they need to re-examine the SEA and whether we move to a one-step process or a multi-step process, we need to revisit that SEA, whether it's in the current format and what is that really, or whether we move it and move towards a system where students transition directly to um, secondary schools. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, Professor Delaire? Yeah. Um, it's important to, to grasp exactly where we are and how our system is different. It's also important to realize that just as we encourage critical thinking from the students, we ourselves have to engage in critical thinking, and that means sometimes thinking out of the box. Um, so, so again, going back to the Singapore issue about intelligent tinkering, um, Trinidadians will have to engage in, in intelligent tinkering in order to reduce the effects of the examination. The, effect, the effects of the examination are very clear. Um, more than half of our schools, according to PISA 2009, and they've graphed it, more than half of the secondary schools um, which underperform, um, which includes students coming in from the 11 plus, um, do very poorly. And all societies are not like that. If you look at the Hong Kong graph, you, you, you realize that you have low SES students, but they are not below the line. In the case of Trinidad and Tobago, they're below the line. So what does that tell us? It tells us that there's a prize being given. Students go to certain schools, but the students who don't get their first choice or who go to different schools are not doing as well as they can. And therefore, part of the answer lies in how do we make sure mm -hmm. that we give everybody a fair chance? Do we give them more information? Do we work on each school through value-added measures so that the schools at the lower end are able to make some progress? But if we want to become a high-performing education system, we can't with that current outcome. And that is the substance of these consultations. Ah, Mr. Sicheran would like to just add something. Yeah, Mr. Sicheran? Um, I think in line with Dr. Delisle and the conversation, the current system placing students on the basis of merit and the other criteria we outlined earlier results in that stratification where students are placed based on performance and therefore you have students who may need more support, all of them being placed in one school and that may not be the best recipe for improving um, the system. And I think that is one of the things that we need to look at if we are to really focus on those fundamental pillars of equity, quality, and access. 
Agreed, agreed. Students who need more support, the question is, do they get it? And we have standing by, ready to share from coming from um, the Home School Association, we have the advisor to the board of the Home School Association, Dr. Fiona Rajkumar. Welcome, Dr. Fiona Rajkumar. Please share with us. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I would be um, also the of this. I am very delighted to be here. Uh, one of the things I would like us to probably think about would be, and it is, it is in line with what um, Mr. Sijran uh, is saying in particular, Mr. Sijran has worked closely with the Home School Association over the past few years, would be us thinking a bit about our educational philosophy, uh, deeply thinking about our how we perceive education. Is it that we need to broaden how we perceive education within the context of Trinidad and Tobago? Uh, and it would, it would also deal with the outcomes, uh, as the Prime Minister spoke about. What do we want to see at the end of not just primary school education, but what are the products of our educational system? Do we want to consider whether or not we should be educating the whole child, a more holistic type of education, where we are able to really focus on not just knowledge, but attitudes and skills as well? Do we want to think about the emotional well-being of children, uh, their physical well-being, their spiritual well-being, culture, uh, relationships? And so I think these are uh, some of the, the reasons you actually find more and more parents choosing homeschooling as a sort of an alternative parallel to the public. And it's not that parents don't want um, what we call a, a rigorous or academic education for their children. Uh, but even as parents, uh, myself included, um, I exposed to more experiences outside of Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean, uh, you realize that there is a broadening of the education system that facilitates the development of critical thinking in children. And so the whole concept of our very narrow education system for primary school children, where they're not meaningfully introduced to subjects like history or literature or even science. Because from very young, there is almost an obsession with doing well in the SEA. And so that focus sort of inadvertently narrows what we focus on as we teach them during these, these very uh, formative years of their lives. And so for me personally, um, as a, a person who has gone through our educational system and who has benefited from our educational system. I gained my PhD at the University of the West Indies. And my, I cannot say that my experience was a negative one. Um, however, in working with my own children, I, I have to admittedly say I see some of the gaps. And so the, the narrowness of our system, I teach history, um, I lecture history. Uh, and I, so I teach my children history. I work with them. We do world history. We work on, on Caribbean history. On, and those subjects where you can facilitate discussion, interaction, the broadening of the child's perspective, I think those are very important subjects um, for the development of critical thinking. Uh, so as I would say, my main contribution is for us to consider our education philosophy. You know, do we want to, to, to cause our children to be lifelong learners? What kinds of skills do we want them to have? Do we want to sort of be stigmatizing children from young, calling them poor performers, when it may just be that we have not yet captured uh, their strengths because our education system at a young age does not allow for that because we are not meaningfully exposing them to the humanities, to the arts, to sports. Uh, and so these children may have to find alternatives outside of the education system to be able to express their strengths. And so I think these are some of the things that we need to seriously think about uh, moving forward and the extent to which, as Mr. Sicheran rightly said, the extent to which the essay can capture that. And as Dr. Delisle said, the extent to which we are willing to pay a price uh, for having the essay as an exam and the extent to which we are Thank able to... Thank you very much, Dr. Rajma. Thank you. Yes. Sorry about that. But... Um, we are very limited as regard to time, with regard to time, and I would like to thank Dr. Rajkumar for that contribution. She spoke to our educational philosophy, how we perceive education, and the fact that the SEA may be actually subverting what we intend to achieve 
um, in the sense that people focus so much on the examinations that they are not paying attention to the actual outcomes, the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes and dispositions of our children. So we will take two very quick comments um, based on that contribution from our panelists. <clears throat> yeah, I think the issue of the outcomes for primary school education, I think, has come up again. Yes. And we need to pay attention to it. I think one of the things that I'm very clear in my mind with is that there is a, a great need or a greater need for a refocusing assessment on formative assessment, which is assessment for learning. Um, I know in one jurisdiction that I visited, no teacher moves ahead before all the skills and competencies are mastered by the entire group. And therefore, if we are to move away from leaving behind students at every level in the education system, I think we need to do that. And one of the mechanisms, if we are talking about assessment, is formative assessment, which is really using the results of assessment to ensure that learning takes place. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor. The problem in trying to change SEA policy is the fact that we have different schools. And maybe people are afraid to say it. You have schools of different quality. So if you look at Finland, there's 5% variation between schools. There isn't 5% variation between the secondary schools in Trinidad or primary schools. As long as we have schools of different quality, the issue of choice, would come up because no parent is going to willingly say, I don't care, put my children wherever. Yes. So we have to make sure that our schools are a high standard. And all the systems that I study from Britain to Shanghai, yes. they focus on mm -hmm. every school becoming a winner. It doesn't mean that all schools have high SES students. Have one. It, mm -hmm. it means that. The school is expected to achieve at a certain level, and if necessary, as Mrs. Citran said, they are given support. Um, just to read a message coming in via social media. Given this scenario, it is my view that greater emphasis should be placed on preparing all students for entry to secondary school. The goal should be one of readiness, and I think you would have alluded to that and not the identification and placement of the brightest for placement into so-called prestige schools. Again, drawing on Professor's point about, and I'm using my own language, all schools should be good schools. Therefore, giving the varying abilities, aptitudes, and interests of students entering secondary schools, the curriculum could be modified. The curriculum should be the difference among our secondary schools. Thank you for your contributions thus far. Members of the public continue to keep the feed going and we go to a break. We'll be right back. What happens at Student Support Services? What is the purpose of Student Support Services? Well, a teacher can refer them, the guidance officer can refer them. And from there, we have a multidisciplinary team that works towards ensuring that this child receives the best type of support. How are teachers there? The students themselves, this is their world. Social media, the platform, the laptop, all of those things, and Zoom, and all of these things, that's their world. This is the start of a journey, bringing you the history of the African people from the beginning of time to the modern era. A TV series based on a unique project put together by UNESCO, known as the General History of Africa. Africa's history written and told by Africans. Welcome back, viewers, and we head right into um, hearing the contribution of a caller from Tunapuna. Tunapuna, you are live? Mr. Mark. Yes, sir. No, my concern is 
zeroing on the main problem in the education system, which is the failure of the black children, the African children. The East Indian children seem to have quite a lot of academic ascendancy, and um, the black children, largely parental, okay, we have a problem at home, but we also have a problem in the classroom with the way the, 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 um, the teachers, the black teachers, deal with their, their black children. What would so be your I recommendation, think, sir? Huh? What would be your recommendation? That we need to focus on what is going wrong with the black students, the black pupils in our school. That is where the focus is. is okay, you know, I hear you. We are lumping it as, uh, as if um, the Indian children are similarly affected as the African children. No. So we need to, to, to call, you know, we need to be more focused, more direct to see what can, what is the problem with the African child. The Indian child is all right. What is wrong with the African child and the African so teacher? We would have gotten the gist of your contribution and it has been taken note of. We have another call coming in. Caller, kindly identify yourself, uh, or rather, where you're calling from. Ah, the caller has um, disconnected. Um, any comments from Mr. Motley, uh, Dr. Rajkumar, with regard to any of the contributions thus far? Um, I would like to probably throw to um, Mr. Motley the whole issue that uh, Mr. Sicharan raised about assessment for learning that teachers do not move on um, to the next, as we say, topic on the curriculum without ensuring mastery by each and every student in the class. Could I get a short take on that? I, uh, I'm i sorry. I think, um, uh, Ms. Talimak, you just have to repeat just briefly ah, the last ah. part. Right? I didn't get it. I didn't quite no, get it. No, I was sorry. just drawing reference to one of the comments that uh, Mr. Sicharan had raised about looking at or having the focus in the primary school in particular being on assessment for learning, that no teacher proceeds to the next area in the curriculum without ensuring that every child has achieved a level of mastery. Now, you work Indeed. directly with principals. You work directly. You are in a school. How do you see yeah. that playing out? And wh what value do you see that bringing to the system? Well, if we are talking about education, as the Prime Minister talked about earlier, about education is about investing in the future of our country, then certainly that has to be the end goal. Where, goal, goal, where it, that we ensure that the child and each child, not as a class, but each, uh, each child masters the level before going forward. But unfortunately, if we focus, if the, the heavy focus is on SCA, which is basically essentially a summative exam, then you find that there is a race to get to the end there is this race. Parents want the children to get to the end as well, eh, by the way, because when you have the conversation with parents and you tell parents, listen, um, I, I don't think your child is yet ready to move to the next level because he or she has not mastered that particular level. You get a bit of a resistance. And one of the concerns that parents, are, and, and rightly so, you get from parents is that how old will my son be? My son or my daughter will not be able to write the exam. They will... The, 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 my child yes. will pass the age and they, yes. they need to write the exam. Understood. So if we remove that time limit, if we remove, mm -hmm. and, and that's mm -hmm. one of the conversations that we've been mm -hmm. having. Among Thank you very much, Mr. Motley, for your contribution on that. We can return to the conversation perhaps a little later. We have a caller standing by. Kara Pachaima, you are live. Hello, good night. Hello, good evening. Kara Hello, Pachaima. Good evening and good night to the panel. Uh, I want to make one or two comments, if I may. Yes, you may, sir. One uh, and a half um, minutes. My first comment is that about the consultation itself, being it on, you know, you have to call in and so on, and I, I would have thought that the conversation should have been in all the constituencies, where people in each constituency could have raised their concerns. That's the first thing. Are you hearing me? Yes, I am. Um, my second concern is about the, about the SEA, which is current now. And um, my, my problem is that um, after the SEA, those children 
who have not qualified in inverted commas um, are being left to go astray it, in, in a kind of sense because um, I don't want to get into my personal thing but I, I, I got it from you a long time ago I taught for 30 years and whatever and whatever but most of the things that I learned were from people who never did well in school in other words they were street smart so maybe we should have a system where we could put these people in a catchment and pull out the things that they have that is beneficial to the society and beneficial to themselves thank you very much thank you very much Karapachaima. and with regard to the comment about having the consultations in every constituency i would just like to remind members of the public that there are many, many ways in which you can contribute. Um, everyone, it is not possible for everyone to contribute via social media or to call into the town hall meetings, but there are suggestion boxes that will be made available in every single constituency in Trinidad and Tobago. Your members of Parliament's offices, there will be suggestion boxes. You can write your contributions um, down and place them in those suggestion boxes. We also have suggestion boxes available at every district office, and they are district offices in the major, um, some of the major towns in Trinidad and Tobago, San Fernando, Port of Spain, Rio Claro, etc., San Grande. You can place your contributions there. Of course, you can email in to the Ministry of Education. Again, educational, education consultation 2020 at moe.gov. Dot tt and of course when we have the live town halls of course the social media um, whatsapp um, platform is available and of course live phone calls so do not allow the fact that everyone cannot call in to stop you from making your contribution they can be written and they can be submitted they can be emailed they can be dropped off so ladies and gentlemen there are multiple ways in which you can contribute keeping in mind that all of us have to be part of the transformation of the education system. So, gentlemen, any comments? Yeah, I think yes. it goes back to my time in the, the ERE. There's the need for greater use. I think, I think we are branching out into the interconnectedness that is required to improve the system making decisions at the primary level in terms of moving ahead and all of that must also utilize data in terms yeah. of identifying groups or subgroups who may be underperforming. I know we started this, but the need to provide resources mm -hmm. where it is needed to support that can only work towards making the system more equitable. So I think that is an area that we need to, to focus on um, you know, very often we talk about average. And I recently read in a book, there's no such thing as uh, the average child, right? So we need to focus on the individual and identifying those students who are underperforming in the system and ensuring yeah. Yeah. that they move ahead with the rest. Thank you. Any closing comments, Professor? I we think have... that's critical to be more evidence-based. So, for example, we are sure that uh, the areas, uh, the, the large areas that underperform on the east side of the island, the, the, the northeast and the southeast. And certainly they need resources to be able to improve their overall per, per, per performance. Mm -hmm. um, the final thing is that we need the system to be more transparent. Yes. Because there's a, a, a process operating in which people have low expectations because of misreading the child's performance, especially the percentile ranks. Um, a percentile rank of 81. Right. Is that 80%? Thank you, Professor. We're yes. sorry to have to cut you off, but we're running out of time. But I think two very critical points as we close, the use of data and, of course, evidence-based practices. And with that, I would very much like to thank both Professor Delisle and Mr. Sitaran for being our very special guest today. And of course, coming in via Zoom, Dr. Fiona Rajkumar, Mr. Lance Motley, uh, Mr. Ronald Mutu, and of course, all our very um, critical callers who called in from parts all across Trinidad and Tobago, and of course, via social media. 
We thank you very much for participating in our first virtual town hall. See you again on Thursday at the same place at the same time. And of course, we continue the conversation, this time looking at the Concordat, uh, that document that was referenced earlier on by another contributor. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for participating. And we continue to contribute via all the other uh, modes that I would have identified um, before. So Trinidad and Tobago and those abroad, have a wonderful evening. Be safe, wash your hands, wear your masks, and see you on Thursday.